I'd like to start tonight uh, to pick up where we left off last week, which was wrapping our heads around the, the core of what we call the recitation of the Shema, and ask you to take your Siddur and have it right handy, because I'd like to refer to it. If you would take your Siddur and turn, if you're using Kol HaNeshama, if you're not using Kol HaNeshama, I can't give you any page numbers, but if you have Kol HaNeshama, this one, turn to page 247, page 247, and I will share my, there we go. No, I want this, okay. Okay, can you all see the screen share here? All right, I want to start by looking with you at, again, a passage from the Talmud, this, in this case from the Mishnah. So we're talking about something that would have been written perhaps in the first century CE. We think of the Mishnah as being completed in the second century CE. And remember last week we talked a little bit about how the, the beginnings of the Siddur, the beginnings of our prayer tradition, were already visible, already in practice at the time that the second temple was standing. So while there was this temple activity, priestly activity, sacrificial activity going on, there was also at the same time in that part of our history, the beginnings of what would become our prayer practice. And in the Mishnah, which was uh, written and, and completed after the temple was destroyed, we have those early sages trying to write down what was going on during the Second Temple period as if they could write it down so they could hold on to it because for at least the first 70 years or so of that exile, there was still a belief and a hope that they were going back to build a third temple. So what we're, it's really remarkable what we're looking at here is language of our early rabbinic ancestors you know, saying, well, let's make sure and write this down because we're going to need somebody to remember it when we are able to go back. And of course, we did go back, but it took until 1948 or so. That's another story. Okay, so look at this with me. This will break down those beginnings of what we now know as the Shema. Uh, the appointed priest, so again, this is rabbis saying, well, what I, the way I remember it is, at the time that the second temple stood, the appointed priest would say, Barhu bracha echat, recite a single blessing. And we think, nowadays, we think that that single blessing was probably what you see on page 247. The blessing that we now think of as the creation bracha. Baruch ata, et cetera, et cetera. Yotzer or, uvore choshech, ose shalom, uvore et hakol. And so that was the creation liturgy for that period. And then the text goes on to say, Karu aseret hadvarim. Ah, then they would say the Ten Commandments, which was initially part of the liturgy. It was considered an important part of the liturgy. Why? Because if you think about what was going on in Second Temple uh, Israel, Second Temple Judah, let's say, uh, Ezra the scribe and Nehemiah the governor have come to help establish uh, a Jewish community in Jerusalem and for the first time the Torah begins to take center stage and so there's there's this idea that your prayers should include passages from the Torah so that you could be speaking Torah every day so in this early formula the Ten Commandments were included Later, the Ten Commandments were removed as a part of the liturgy. We don't say them today. We haven't said them for many, many generations as part of our prayers. Uh, maybe we can talk about that another time. Okay, so then what happens next? The Shema. So now, if you would take your Siddur and turn ahead to the Shema, which in the Kohan Neshama Siddur is on page 277. I think familiar to, to many of you, maybe all of you, there's the actual line, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The second line, which we say quietly, and Ve'ahavta, that paragraph which we call Ve'ahavta. We're going to have another 
time to look at those. We're not going to really study those tonight. Now, turn ahead in your C-Door to page 283. And you see the paragraph that begins, Vehaya im Shamoa. Here it is in the Mishnah. We start with Shema, then Vehaya im Shamoa, which is in our translation, if you truly listen to what's being said to you. And now turn the page in your Siddur one more time to 85, Vayomer, which is what the Mishnah tells us right here. So if you can sort of look at both in a sense, look at your Siddur so you can see there the Vayomer paragraph, which we refer to often as the paragraph of the fringes because it talks specifically about the corners of the talit. Uh, but let's see if, if will it just let me highlight it. Here we go. Here's the, the basic outline of the Shema on your screen. Shema, Vehaya im Shamoa, and Vayomer. And those three components are still very much at the core of what we call the recitation of the Shema. Okay, I'm going to leave the rest of this Mishnah for another time because tonight is our night to look at Ahava Rabbah. It's our second session. Today is the 24th. And we've called this session Starting with Love. Because somewhere between this initial architecture of the Shema that we've just looked at and the canon, canonization, redaction of the Mishnah, a new introduction has been added. And it's called Ahava Rabbah, Great Love. I don't have the Mishnaic citation to show it to you, but I can promise you that it's there. Let me just scroll ahead now. Uh, so here's the text on screen. I, I put it here just so it would be easy to refer to it, but it's also in your Siddur on page 272 and 3. Page 272 and 3. And this is the opening part of this whole Torah section, the section that we call Revelation, or the blessing of Torah, which has at its core the Shema, and Ve'ahavta, and Ve'haya im Shamoa, and Vayomer. So I'm going to stop the share just before I go on and just see if is anything I'm saying so far not making sense. I want to really make sure that everybody uh, understands. And there's just, there is no shame in saying, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Please go over. Any questions at all? Go ahead, Audrey. Don't, uh, can you unmute yourself? No. Shelly, can you? Can we? Here. Uh, there we are. Okay. Um, Rachel, I'm just curious. This, this, you haven't covered this specifically, but the section um, is called the Shema and its blessings. Right. I don't understand the reference, it's blessings. It's, well, in Hebrew, it's Shema Uvirchoteha, which is literally the Shema and her blessings. So it's the Shema, the line of the Shema, and then all the things that have accrued around it. So what, what we're learning in our six-week se series is the, the middle of that fuller outline. And Audrey and others, um, we've talked before about this notion of creation, revelation, redemption. Does that sound familiar from Yesodot, Audrey? Yeah. Creation, revelation, redemption, three major pillars of the Siddur. And the Shema is at the core of them. What we're focusing on in our six weeks is the revelation section of the Siddur. So that helps some. So it's, it's, it's the Shema and all of this that, that it surrounds it, but it starts with the Shema. Okay. All right. Any other... Um, I meant to say at the outset, I, what I'm going to do in these sessions is when we hit 6.30, not 6.30, when we hit 7 o'clock, I will end the, the session and you're welcome to go, but I'll stay on for a few more minutes if people have questions or anything you want to talk over. I can stay on for, you know, 10 minutes, but we will end it at 7 o'clock. Okay, let me go back now to, ah. I wanted to say one other thing. So how does this Ahavaraba creep in? What is this and why does it get added? One theory is, remember that we're talking about the exact period in history when Judaism and Christianity are starting to differentiate themselves one from the other. 
we often think, we often are taught or, or um, suggested to us that Christianity is a religion of love and Judaism is a religion of law. And I, I've, I've sometimes wondered if, if this Ahava Rabbah or those rabbis attempt to say, wait, 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 we're also a religion of love. We have love. We like love. We just think of it in a different way. So I, I wonder, I don't know, I don't have any proof to share with you, but I, I imagine that that's a piece of how this introduction to the Shema got inserted and established as, um, as liturgy to say before we would actually say the Shema itself. So let's take a look at it. Um, does, uh, let me go ahead, I'll screen share. I think m many of you or maybe even all of you have it in front of you as well. Okay. So let's just walk through the words here. Ahava Raba Ahavtanu, great love, and we're going to see in, a, in just a moment one of our commentators this week has already something to say about that. Ahava Raba, great love, Ahavtanu, we have been loved by Adonai, Eloheinu, our God. Chemla Gedola, what John, Rabbi, Lord John, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs translates as surpassing mercy, overwhelming mercy, great mercy, and beyond, chamalta alenu. Chamalta is the verb form of chemla. Chemla is mercy, so chamalta is like we have been mercied, if it doesn't really work in English, but that's sort of what it's saying. Okay, so the, the opening sort of parlay of the Shema is a great statement about love about God's expansive love for us. It goes on to say, Avinu Malkenu, which some scholars say is, does it sound like Rosh Hashanah? It's for good reason, because it's a direct connection, Avinu Malkenu. We are addressing God as our Father, our King. Ba'avor avotenu, in our Sidur we say, Ba'avor avotenu ve'imotenu, by way of the relationship that you, God, had with our fathers and our mothers. In other words, those ancestors are always present in our prayers. They are the founding generation of this eternal relationship that we're always searching for. By way of that relationship that was secure or trusting in you, Shabbat Chuvecha, that they trusted in you, Vatalamdeim Chuke Chaim, and you taught them the laws of life. So also please grace, grace us and teach us. So we often think of the Amidah as the place where we invoke the ancestors, but here's another place where it's get, that founding generation is getting, founding generations, I guess we should say, getting invoked with very clear language. We call on the strength of their trust in God to help us find that sense of faith and trust. Okay, then just going on here. Avinu, our father, ha'av harachaman, the father who is um, characterized by compassion. Ham rachem rachem. Now look at this. We've got three, three words that are in a row, all with the same root. Resh, chet, mem, racham. Compassion, Ooh, will it let me highlight there? Do you see this? Rachaman, rachem, rachem. It's the language is working so hard to triply emphasize to us this quality of compassion that we want to find when we are in our prayers. Bestow it on us, we're saying. And finally, the ten belibenu, give us, we would say into our hearts, but remember that libenu, or lev in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, lev doesn't mean heart quite the way we mean it. It means something more like consciousness. It's, um, it's an open channel between our intelligence and our emotional uh, awareness, if, to put it in more modern language. Ten belibenu, and then we have a string of verbs, lehavin, to understand. Lehaskil to be enlightened, lishmoa to to hear deeply, lilmod to study, ulilamed and to teach because it never ends with us, 
leash more to observe or to uh, to guard the la asot and to do so it's not just about belief and faith but it's meant to ultimately lead us to a place of action and finally ulekayem and to uphold et kol divrei talmud torah techa be'ahava to uphold all the words of Torah and Torah learning with love. So we begin with love and we end with love. Okay, look with me now at some commentary. This is from uh, Rabbi Reuven Hammer, whose book Entering Jewish Prayer is still a foundational text for a lot of people interested in learning about prayer. He does the thing of counting up how many different times love and mercy and Torah get mentioned in this introduction to the Shema. I went ahead and counted it, and I, I counted a little bit differently, but I'm not going to argue with Reuben Hammer. Um, but you can see here, he says, love appears multiple times, uh, mercy appears multiple times, um, compassion two times he even says mercy and compassion really are just other forms of love. Torah is emphasized, commandments and laws. So you could, you could almost imagine where some sages were sitting around a table saying, hey, the 10 commandments are what we've been saying, but we don't think that's really a good idea. Let's come up with something else that will still help us hold on to the idea, the, the notion of reciting Torah, but in a way that will keep us connected through our uh, our awareness our emotional intelligence also so i bolded his his point in this paragraph the message is the same ah in the evening and the morning we'll look at that in a second god's love for israel is expressed through torah and commandments so that that central idea can't be emphasized clearly enough it comes up in this ahavaraba which is the morning introduction to the shema it also comes up, here I'll stop the share for a second. If you keep your finger at Ahava Rabbah in your Siddur and turn back towards the beginning, uh, earlier part of the Siddur and find your way to page 63. Page 63 is Ahavat Olam, which is translates as something like eternal love or everlasting love. It's the evening introduction to the Shema and has much the same message behind it. The Torah is the token of love between our people and God. The Torah is how we understand God's love. By studying it, by trying to follow what it has to say to us, maybe even by wrestling with it, that's how we understand God's love. It's, it's, um, it's in, in some ways a very concrete and, uh, I don't know, physical somehow. It's, it requires certain action, a little bit different than what we um, come to understand about Christian love, which doesn't have these kinds of Torah requirements behind it. Okay, let me go back to our screen share. So I'm really focusing tonight on Ahava Rabbah, the morning introduction to the Shema, but you can see it's the very similar language in the evening, just a slightly different formula. Okay, now look with me at this. I'm back on the screen now. This is a, a, a teaching that comes from Dr. Tamar Frankel, who is uh, the dean of the Academy for Jewish Religion. She comments, a prayer of thanks for God's love feels pretty straightforward. Ahava does not mean with great love. And you'll notice in our Siddur, they do translate it that way, with an abounding love. She says that would be more like be'ahava rabba, but simply ahava, great love. Literally, you have loved us, great love. As a portal, and she uses that language of each prayer is a portal to a certain world. As a portal, it is this, like a sign above the door of a storefront saying, abundant love, enter here, come through this portal. And she asks us this question, what can happen when we walk into the world of divine love, of abundant love? And of course, that's a, um, a portal and, a, and a, a love that we summon in our 
consciousness, in our awareness. It doesn't exist, it's not magical thinking. It's something that's in us that we can summon and begin to realize. Then she goes on. Another phrase then meets us. Chem la gedola. So just look back at the text so you see what she's talking about. Ahavaraba, there it is, what she opened with. And then here's Chem la gedola, which we would translate as something like great mercy, or uh, I think she's going to tell us here. She likes Rabbi Sachs, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, I love Hashalom. He translates as surpassing compassion. The root chemla is we can sometimes hear it um, more commonly on Yom Kippur, and it also appears in the morning prayer when we say Moda ni lefanecha melechai v'kayam. We hear that root in that opening formula as well. The context in both cases stresses the chasm bridged between sovereign, God, and human, between creator and created through compassion. When the sages put it into our daily prayers, they added a dimension to the idea of divine love. And she says, I think the two phrases should be read in parallel. Ahavaraba, we have been loved and chem la gedola, and you have even more surpassing mercy for us. This is all by way of warming us up so that we can get ready for the next section, which we're going to look at next week. Uh, there are these two opening introductions to the Shema. So this is really what I wanted to cover tonight, to make the connection between love and Torah. And before we close for this evening, look with me back at the Siddur, page 272. And just wanted to bring this learning this evening to a close by hearing the words of Rabbi Arthur Green, one of the, the really the, uh, one of the central teachers at, at the Reconstruction Rabbinical College when this Siddur was being compiled. So only because we're a big group, I'm just going to go ahead and read this. Ahava Rabbah may be called the quintessentially Jewish prayer. In boundless love for Israel, God gives the greatest gift imaginable, teachings that will help us to live. What more could we want from the loving parent, combining attributes of both father and mother, who here becomes the compassionate teacher, sharing the gift of true knowledge with children, who have become disciples. What else could you possibly want? We pray that we may have the open and understanding heart to receive these teachings, to make them real by our deeds and to pass them on to others. This is our response to God's love, a commitment to study, to live the life of Torah, and to carry it forward to future generations. I wanted to, uh, to come back to the musical setting that I was playing for us as we entered. This is by a beautiful young artist, Marnie Lofman. as you see her there in the center of the screen. She was actually a teacher in our religious school earlier in the pandemic and then went on, much to our sadness, uh, to graduate school, but she's continued to write and record. And she gives us a way of putting some of these important words in our mouths that may be a little more accessible than the, the more traditional kind of self-chanting that we do sometimes in the synagogue. So I'm going to play just a little bit of this, not the whole thing, and invite us to listen in, and then we'll end together. So let me bring this back to the beginning.
just want to pause now to see uh well let me let me do this it's just going on seven o'clock so that's what i wanted to share with us for tonight to get to know this part of the liturgy a little maybe differently a little more clearly to suggest that the the expansive love that is articulated in the Siddur is something we're meant to, again, to summon for ourselves as we continue to look for a relationship with the source of life that is at the core of this part of the Siddur, maybe the whole Siddur. So let me say thank you all for tuning in this evening. And uh, if anyone wants to stay with me, stay here, any questions, anything you want to talk about, I will remain. And thank you again so much to Shelley for being with me early this evening and helping to welcome everyone in. It's great to be with all of you. Everyone keep well and see you again soon. Rachel, I have a question about Ahava Rabah. Yes. Shelly, um, do I, don't, I don't seem to be able to pause the recording. Do you want to do oh. that? I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do want to.